इंडिया नरेंद्र मोदी फ्रेंड्स there is a voice of tdmp also and i know who must be that do you know and the winner of this voice of tdmp is none other than the only one dr snail thakkar give him a high round of applause please wonderful Not even president knew till last night, huh? These two hours. It's a surprise. Breaking news, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Snehan. Thank you, sir. I'll keep this voice growing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. But your voice is not coming. Taliyan, zordar, bajaye. See, every game has a rule, some rule, some plan. So today's plan is what they have worked out. I have worked out with Asif Pochi. Those who are going to clap more louder are going to get the lucky prize. Thank you. Thank you, Sushil Bhai. I have to give you two thanks. First, on behalf of TDMPA, or rather three. Second, on behalf of the audience, and third, on my personal thanks. I never knew that you have planned a such a big surprise for me and for all of us. So, friends. Uh, after having finished the formalities of the opening and all, we start with our scientific session. And uh, our first speaker is a usual professional. We hear a lot of uh, reports in uh, media and all that Indian cricket team has a real problem of getting a good opening batsman. But TDMK is very fortunate because we have to serve. Dr. Krishna Kumar has been associated with TDMPA, I think since ages now. And he has delivered the keynote on the opening address. Well-known IVR consultant, gynec endoscopic surgeon and obstetrician. His director of Nirviti Fertility and IVR Center, also Kumar's nursing home doctor. He is attached to Fortin Hospital Kalyan. He has done his fellowship in endoscopic surgery from Germany and France, also fellowship in IPA from Belgium. He has won the best paper in endoscopy in Fox annual conference for many years. He is the first Indian gynecologist to be certified by the European Society of Human Reproduction and uh, Embryology. And last but the most important introduction of Dr. Kumar is, he is with the DDMP since several years. Thank you sir for your valuable support. Please start with it. Another TDMPA conference, but the same old faces. President Sashank Pawar, Nevan Tuankadi, Mota Sai, Takkar, Punam Pawar, Rajesh, Bhatt, and so many of you. The same faces, and you see the same face, Dr. Krishna Kumar, and here. Good morning to you all, and wish you all a very happy new year. Well, President Pawar just said that I have been, like Tendulkar, associated with TDMP and I am always the opening guard. I will continue to do that till the TDMP selection committee gets bored of me and says you are not fit further. Otherwise, you will get bored of me so that we will be assured that I am always there. And thanks for the invitation to the committee and thanks for the nice introduction that others gave about me. Well, we are always there to update your knowledge as somebody said that we are just mortals and we have to do our duty to the best of ability, whatever you are, wherever you are. And as an infertility specialist, it's always our duty not to just treat our patients or treat your patients who are coming to us, helping them achieve what they desire, but also keep you updated on certain aspects of infertility which we all commonly see. And today I think this topic was suggested by the TDMPA committee itself that I should talk on infertility associated with fibroids. Now fibroids is what just a smooth muscle tumor that is the musculature of the uterine lamma musculature grows a little more and that is called also called as leomyoma and it is the commonest tumor in the women almost about 40 to 50 percent of them 
carry fibroid in the uterus or carry fibroid in the abdomen without even realizing. So what are the factors generally associated? Some amount of element of genetic predisposition is definitely associated, but the major culprit is the hyperestrogenism. That is more of estrogen in the body and the receptors in these uterus are hyper reactive to the estrogen which is the hormone which makes the uterine musculature and the endometrium grow. Whereas progesterone is the hormone which is opposite of estrogen and that inhibits the growth but these patients have less of progesterone receptors, they have more of estrogen receptors but and that is why it is not seen in girls who are not at a distant menarche because estrogen hormone is not there. But today why is fibroid increasing? Because of delay in reproduction. Now women are all busy in work, in study and so they delay their pregnancy and that's why the incidence of fibroid is increasing because the estrogen is going uninhibited and other family, strong family history, obesity, early menarche, diabetes, hypertension well, if you are using certain contraceptives and other thing, you, it may definitely give you a less chance of fibroids. Now, fibroids are such that usually they are multiple, may be very large, occasionally almost about 15 centimeters and they are usually very firm to add unless they are degenerated where they become a little soft. But most of them have a false capsule, the surrounding musculature forms a nice covering and that's how we differentiate it from the another fibroid of the smooth muscle which is called as adenomyoma where there is no true capsule and hence fibroid can be easily enucleated. Now just for your knowledge, fibroids are generally classified into one which is submucus which is more inside the cavity Whereas one which is outside on the surface of the uterus is called subserous. One which is a pedicle, subserous is called pedunculated, and what is it is inside the muscle is called intramural, and one which is protruding from the muscle into the endometrium is also submucous. They all have clinical significance as far as the symptoms which fibroid causes, like bleeding or infertility. It is mostly the submucous fibroid or those intramural fibroids which are abutting the endometrium, which are close to the endometrium of the uterus here will affect implantation and pregnancy and that's where those fibroids are the one which can cause infertility and those are the patients whom we will select and definitely advise as far as fibroid removal is concerned if infertility is the only problem. Well, I wouldn't go into detail about the other a classification. Usually, as I said, many of them carry fibroid. It's almost asymptomatic in about 60 percent. Women don't realize. Only 30 or 40 percent of patients do they cause some common abnormal problems like most commonly the heavy menstrual bleeding or pain and abnormal uterine bleeding. We are going to restrict ourselves to infertility. I wouldn't today talk much about the other pressure symptoms because I have been just given I think 25-30 minutes so we wouldn't talk and today we will restrict and as I rightly said women who delay their first pregnancy later the fibroid delays her pregnancy the moment she doesn't want to get pregnant and that's where the estrogen keeps accumulating and then she realizes that she has a fibroid and when she wants to become pregnant the fibroid is now telling her you can't become fibroid pregnant so that's why you have to counsel your patient who are married or young to go in for pregnancy much faster or much earlier in their life. Well, certain women conceive with the fibroid and continue the pregnancy, there is no harm. Many women with fibroid do become pregnant. All fibroids do not cause fertility, infertility. And what happens during pregnancy is this. It can cause abortion, it can cause pressure symptoms, malpresentation, premature labor, uterine inertia, postpartum hemorrhage, and dystocia. It, and in the pure period period, it can get infected, can get necrosis, and can become subinvolutated uterus. So these are the effects of fibroid in pregnancy. So in patients who do not conceive, almost 30 to 40 percent will have fibroid. Well, usually, as I already said, this endocavity fibroid or this large submucous fibroid is definitely going to affect pregnancy because the normal uterine cavity is just two and a half centimeters and this fibroid which is almost a five centimeter has stretched the uterine cavity to enormous extent and definitely no embryo can definitely implant here. And submucous fibroid decreases pregnancy by almost 70 percent. 
So these are the fibroids which have to be tackled immediately in every and any infertile woman. Whereas intramural subserous fibroids generally are not supposed to cause infertility. Intramural fibroids can cause if they are abetting the endometrium. Mechanism why fibroids causes infertility. It could be so many theses have hypotheses have been created. Either it interferes with the sperm migration or ovum transport. It causes reverse peristalsis of the fallopian tube that doesn't allow the egg to come into the uterus but throws it out. Abnormal uterine contractility and such large submucous fibroid may be causing local endometrial inflammation and reduces the blood supply. And that's why the implantation doesn't actually happen. Fibroids which are very near the cer or cervix or on the cervix, there could be anatomical distortion and uterus also seems to be contracting the reverse way. Patients whom we are doing with for infer IVF, there where we are just implanting or transferring the embryo which is created in the lab, again have a higher failure rate because fibroid must be causing reverse peristalsis which is commonly with intramural fibroid. Now, how to diagnose fibroid? Today the commonest method is just by a simple ultrasound, a good ultrasound will identify the submucous fibroid or an intramural fibroid. Though MRI may be more accurate, but it is not needed. Sonography picks up almost 99.99% of fibroids, and we all limit our investigation as far as diagnosing fibroid is just by simple transvaginal sonography. Very well, treatment depends on multiple factors: the age of the patient, the symptom, as I said, and the location, and I already have, I wouldn't uh, again again tell that one which is intramural, distorting the endometrial cavity, when infertile patient, we would try to rather treat or remove. Other location, there are a lot of controversies, we wouldn't go into that. And any patient having, of course, menstrual, heavy menstrual bleeding due to fibroids, she would definitely need treatment. Well, as I already said, submucous and intramural fibroids which distort the cavity needs interference, needs surgery, where sub subserosal fibroid may not require much interference or surgery. Lot of evidence has proved that women with submucous myoma demonstrate much, much lower pregnancy rate and the moment the fibroid is removed, their pregnancy and the implantation rate are increased. Whereas there is no evidence to suggest that subserosal fibroid removal increases the pregnancy. Submucosal fibroid have almost 70% increase in chance of pregnancy, whereas intramural fibroid are debatable. Those intramural fibroid which are very close to this endometrium or those intramural fibroid where the woman has not conceived and the size is more than four years and unexplained factors, everything else is normal. We are justified in removing the fibroid, otherwise not. What are the treatment options available for an infertile patient? with fibroid and then you offer some treatment, what are the treatment options available? Definitely, the other two which I said, uterine artery embolization and MRI focused ultrasound are non-invasive methods where they directly attack, stop the blood supply to the fibroid, but those are still not recommended for patients who desire pregnancy, though the, it is very less invasive than the options today available, but right now they cannot be used for patients who desire pregnancy in fertility treatment. It is restricted for patients who are requiring for other reasons of fibroid like heavy menstrual bleeding. And today myomectomy is the only option. But definitely we have moved away from the major laparotomy incision and today laparoscopy or hysteroscopy is the gold standard in treatment of myomas or fibroids. Here I'll just give you a small clipping how a laparoscopic myomectomy is considered is done. On the left side you will see the fibroid being enucleated from the uh, uterine musculature with the help of energy devices without much damage to the surrounding myometrium. That's the secret because the myometrium has to withstand the pregnancy later on the nine months of stretching. So you cannot destroy the musculature and cause rupture because that's always the fear. So when you cut such large incision on the uterus, which is otherwise just five centimeters, till nine months it goes up to the zippy stem and it should be able to withstand the stretch and shouldn't rupture at the time of pregnancy or labor. And here you can see on the other side, right side, how such large myomas are taken out of the body by just tissue marcellation.